Hi, uh, my name is Greg Nellis, and uh, this is uh, the webinar entitled uh, Property Data. So here we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the uh, property data and property correlations for thermodynamic and transport uh, information that are uh, programmed in EASE. Uh, EASE provides the thermodynamic and transport properties for just a very large number of engineering fluids. Um, it's one of the things that makes EASE so popular with people working in um, industries that use, uh, that use these transport fluids. Um, there's uh, convenient, high accuracy functions, uh, functions that are every bit as good as those found in some of the RefProp databases. Um, one of the nice things about EASE is that the property functions are programmed in a way such that they are flexible with regards to the input parameters that are used to fix the state. Um, so they converge in a robust manner and you can uh, fix the state using, <coughs> uh, for example, temperature and pressure, but in some problems you may want to fix the state using enthalpy and pressure or specific volume and temperature. And ease allows essentially an unlimited combination of parameters uh, to fix the state. And this uh, obviously eliminates the tedious process that uh, you would have to go through if you were trying to get states from tables and um, you know particularly in a thermodynamics class it allows you to do very uh, interesting problems um, in, a, in an efficient way allowing students to move beyond sort of um, the tedium associated with interpolating from tables and, and on into more interesting system type analyses and then if you're a professional engineer of course it's just a an invaluable tool. Before we use uh, property functions, we really have to uh, first set the unit system uh, within ease. And uh, the unit system in ease uh, essentially specifies to ease uh, what are the units of the input properties that we will use to fix the state, and then um, what are the units that ease will use when it outputs a property to the equations window. So it's important that that be set up ahead of time and, and we all know exactly what's expected there. Uh, there's two ways to set the unit system. One is if I go to the preferences dialog, I can uh, select the unit system tab. So let's go to ease and I'll show you this. Under options, preferences, one of the tabs here is unit system. And in this uh, unit system dialog, I can set you know exactly what I want. Do I want to work in SI or English units? Um, you know, what temperature units and energy units and pressure units would I like to use? Do I want to work on a mass or a molar basis? So when I talk about specific enthalpy, is it joules per kilogram or joules per kilogram mole? Um, you know, in English units, I, I would have these kind of uh, units to choose from. You can't select mixed units. You'll notice if I select SI units, everything has to be in SI units. If I select English units, everything has to be in, in English units. So that's one way to do it. Um, this is a, a nice way to do it. Um, probably a better way to set the units is w with the unit system directive. The unit system directive is a directive that sits at the top of your equations window and specifies the unit system. Um, the reason it's probably a better way to set the unit system is because, um, it, first of all, it's visible. So when you look at the equations window, you can see exactly what units are being used. And second of all, it's portable. So when you save your ease code, and reload it, let's say, on somebody else's computer, you know exactly what the unit system has been set at. You're no, you, 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 there's no worry that his preferences are different than your preferences, and so the unit system has changed. Um, the unit systems set in the, the unit system, dollar unit system directive will override those set in the preferences. So let's use the dollar unit system directive here. In order to use that, um, basically I make all the same selections that I would have made I'm um, using the uh, the unit system dialog right here. So I can select SI or English, mass or molar. Um, I can select from these pressure units and temperature units and so forth. Um, here I'll set the unit system directive and I'll select uh, SI. I'll use a mass basis. I'll use temperature units of Kelvin, pressure units of Pascal. Um, what else? Energy units of joules. And um, I guess that's good enough. It doesn't matter. What order I select, put these things in, I could have put, you know, mass first and then SI and so forth. And I don't actually have to specify everything. Whatever I don't specify will be 
um, specified from what is um, set in the uh, in the unit systems tab of the preferences uh, dialog. So this is uh, this is how you set the unit system, and again, um, you have to do that uh, before you access any of the of the property information in ease. Um, property functions are at least organized and can be viewed conveniently using the function information dialog. So let's go to the function information dialog. If you go to options, here's function information. And, uh, you know, this first radio button is just all the mathematical functions in ease. But these, these other ones are, are um, for other things. And uh, you can see there's uh, fluid properties. Fluid properties here refers to compressible fluids. So these are... Um, you know, fluids whose density is not constant, um, thermodynamic fluids. There's a few other uh, options here which we'll get to. Solid liquid properties, those are compressible fluids, or incompressible fluids. Um, so relatively simpler fluid models. And then in the library functions in the external routines, you can also find some um, additional fluid properties that are not internally programmed in ease but rather have been externally programmed and integrated with ease but for now let's stick with compressible fluids right here um, within compressible fluids what we have are probably the most interesting fluids which are real fluids and real fluids are those fluids it, it, that can exist in a subcooled two-phase and superheated state of course all fluids can do that but what I mean is um, real fluids in these have property correlations that will allow them to exist in these different states. Um, one thing to remember is something you should have learned in um, thermodynamics, which is the phase rule, and that says that if I have a single phase pure fluid, in order to fix the state, I need to specify two intensive properties. So whenever I use any of these property functions, you know, before it can return for me the specific enthalpy of a fluid, I have to fix the state, which means I have to specify two intensive properties um, in, the, in the calling uh, property function. So the calling protocol for a property function should make some kind of sense um, given, given this, uh, you know, what we know about the phase rule. And the calling protocol is down here. Um, let's go through this one by one. Um, the first, uh, the first thing you have to specify is the uh, is the function name. So this is the specific property function that you're that you're calling. The function name basically corresponds to what is the property that you want. So there are property functions called enthalpy, which returns specific enthalpy, and volume, which returns specific volume, and temperature, and so on and so forth. So this is really what is the property that you want. Um, the second the, the first argument here is the name of the fluid that's being considered. There's literally hundreds of fluids programmed in ease. You have to specify, do I want the properties of water or ammonia or R134A and so forth and so on. And then the remainder <coughs> of, the, um, of the call here basically s fixes those two intensive, um, intensive properties so that I can fix the state. Um, so this first... Um, uh, uh, set of, of, of parameters here fixes the first property. What I have are um, property one, which is an indicator that tells the you know what is the property that's being used to fix the state. The indicator could be T for temperature, or P for pressure, or V for volume, and so on. And then equals, and then value one. This is the value of that property. So if I were to type in T equals 100. I would be saying to ease um, the temperature is equal to 100 and of course the value of 100 had better correspond to the value that is uh, consistent with the unit system that we just set. So when I use that dollar unit system directive and I set Kelvin, ease will expect if I type in T equals 100, I'm talking about 100 Kelvin. And then it's the same thing for this second property. Right? Property 2 is the second uh, indicator and it equals some value, and you know this could be p equals 100,000 pascals or something of that sort. So you know, let's do a real simple example. Let's compute the specific volume of R134A at 350 Kelvin and uh, 250 kilopascals. So coming back to here, 
um, you know, I've set my unit system. I know exactly what's expected here. Um, v equals, well, the property name that I want is, uh, I want to access the volume function because that returns specific volume. So volume. The first argument is the fluid, R134A. And then I have to fix the state. And in this case, the state is fixed by temperature and pressure. So I'd write T equals 350 Kelvin and P equals 250 Pascals, right? It wouldn't have worked for me to write 250 kilopascals because that is not consistent with the properties that I've set up here with my unit system. I have to write 250,000 Pascals. And now I'll hit solve, and I find that the, uh, the specific volume is 0 0.1108. And of course, what are the, the units of the specific volume that ease is returned with the volume function? Well, they're the SI units as specified up here in this dollar unit system directive. And, you know, at, at this point, I haven't set the units of specific volume, and therefore ease is saying, oh, there's a unit error, right? I am returning specific volume from this function in meters cubed per kilogram. The variable that you're using here has no units. That's, that's a problem. So um, when I solve this, I need to go in here and specify the units of this and, you know, ease checks, right? Ease is checked that these inputs are in the right units, and ease is checked that the output uh, is in the right units. Um, this is just a list of the property functions that are available, and there's just an awful lot of these. Um, most of the ones on this slide should be familiar to you, I think. Um, there's a comprehensive list in the, uh, the Mastering Ease chapter that accompanies these seminars. Um, you can see things like uh, conductivity and, of course, you know, the different specific heats and density and enthalpy and so forth. Um, there's some other ones here, like uh, molar mass, right, molar mass. Of course, if I call the molar mass function, I don't need to provide um, two intensive properties to fix the state. The molar mass of a fluid is, is whatever it is, and so I, that function only, only requires the name of the fluid. Um, the same with the critical pressure. Um, there's a saturation pressure function here. Of course, if I want the saturation pressure, I only need to provide the temperature. And, and there's other ones here that you can, you can look at. There's actually um, some uh, relatively more, let's say, esoteric or rarely used functions that, that might be of interest, acentric factor and um, dipole moment and so forth. And those are all programmed in ease as well. Um, you know, more information about these different functions can be found in really any graduate level thermal book, um, including the one listed listed here. Um, this is a list of the real fluids programmed in ease. So again, these are the fluids that have property correlations that extend through the subcooled state into the superheated state and through the vapor dome. And there's you know there's a wide range of these. Most of them have really high quality um, uh, equations of state programmed behind them. There are a few that have you know, less high quality equations of state, the Martin Howe equation of state. Um, and those are indicated here. And then um, this steam IAPWS is the uh, IAPWS correlation for water. And that is only available in the professional version of ease. That's why it's marked uh, in that way. So property indicators. The, the example we just did was T and P, right? I used temperature and pressure, but again, you can use essentially anything you want, and, and the, there's a list here of the different legitimate property indicators, and you can, you can use essentially any two of these in any combination. Um, so, for example, if I come back here, you know, I got volume given temperature and pressure. Now that I have volume, I could get the temperature at the specific volume I calculated here and this pressure. And, of course, I had better get 350 Kelvin. So let's do that. T equals temperature of R134A at uh, the property indicator is V, and I'll just set that equal to the specific volume I calculated here, and P equals 250,000 Pascal. And if I hit solve, 350 Kelvin, right? Um, I can do the same thing with enthalpy and entropy and uh, internal energy and so forth, but uh, you can see the, the beauty of being able to use any two specific um, properties or intensive properties to fix the state. Um, 
Uh, one note about two-phase states, uh, because this is a, a, a mistake that is pretty common, and that is, you know, of course, you cannot fix a two-phase state using temperature and pressure. If I, you know, if you give me the saturation temperature and the saturation t pressure, um, I, I don't know that state. It could be anywhere from saturated liquid to saturated vapor, and so it's important that you not accidentally do that. Um, let's do a real simple example here. Um, involving eth ethanol. So first, um, let's specify the fluid using a string variable. So this is ethanol. Um, this is actually a nice thing to do, and that is rather than type the name of the fluid in every single property call, I can define a string variable that is the name of the fluid and use that. It saves on typing, and the other thing it does is if I have a vapor compression cycle model and I want to change the refrigerant from R134A to R11 or something like that, I only have to change the string variable. I don't have to go through the entire program. So let's do that and let's uh, set the pressure to be equal to standard atmospheric pressure, which is a built in constant in ease, P naught uh, pound, and we'll get the normal boiling point. So the normal boiling point I would get using the um, the function TSAT, so saturation, a temperature, and the fluid name, and then for saturation temperature, of course, I don't have to give two intensive properties, just one, just the uh, just the pressure. So P equals P, and if I solve this, I find that the normal boiling point is 351.4 Kelvin. So okay, now maybe I'd like to know the specific volume of ethanol at atmospheric pressure and the normal boiling point. And of course, that's an undefined quantity because it could be anywhere from saturated liquid to saturated vapor. So V equals volume, F dollar, P equals P, and T equals the boiling point temperature. And what ease will do now is give me an error. Oh, yeah, the wrong error will give me an error and the error says that you know you're this is a stupid thing to do you can't give me the saturation pressure and saturation temperature and expect me to give you back a, a property um, this is the best case scenario because you threw up an error um, if you have you know just a very slight um, deviation in the pressure or the temperature away from the saturation pressure or temperature um, then it's likely ease won't detect that you have given it the saturation temperature and pressure and it will give you back an answer and this is almost worse because you know what has it done if your temperature is just a little bit too high it's going to give you the vapor um, property if it's just a little bit too low it'll give you the liquid property and in fact neither might be what you what you really wanted so just keep in mind that you know this combination pressure and temperature is not um, sufficient to define uh, the property in a two-phase state. Right? In a two-phase state, often you're going to want to use quality, and quality is a, a, an accepted property indicator in ease. Um, so, for example, maybe I want the specific volume of saturated liquid ethanol. So that would be volume of ethanol, so F dollar at uh, P equals P, and then quality, which is X equals zero. That's the specific volume of saturated liquid. And then V sub G is the specific volume at P equals P and X equals one. That's the specific volume of saturated vapor. And if I solve this, you know, I can see that uh, saturated liquid is 0 0.00135 and saturated vapor is 0.5971 meters cubed per kilogram. Um, there's also a property function called quality that will return the quality of a two-phase state. So if I want the quality of, uh, let's get the, the quality of ethanol, so quality F dollar at P equals P and V equals 0.3 meters cubed per kilogram. So we'll solve that. Um, the quality is like 50%. If you give the function quality here um, a state that is subcooled, of course quality doesn't make any sense then and it will return minus 100. So if I gave it here 
instead of 0.3, let's look at the solution again, I give it 0 0.0013, something that's lower than, um, than saturated liquid. And we solve that, it's going to give me minus 100. Um, because quality doesn't make any sense. And this should be a flag to you that you have subcooled liquid. At the same time, if I give it something that's in the superheated state, so what's the uh, 0.597 is saturated vapor. If I give it 0.7 here and solve, quality will be equal to 100. So that's how it deals with states that aren't um, two phase. Okay, so let's return to the function information dialog now and just look a little bit more at um, the, the different options that are available for compressible fluids. So let's go back here and uh, you know, we said that uh, these are compressible fluids and if I'm within the compressible fluids menu here you'll notice I still have some selections to make and one is real fluids. So these are the fluids we've been talking about. These are the fluids that go from subcooled through the two phase and into the superheated. There's some other ones here that we'll talk about here um, in future slides and these are fluids that are modeled as an ideal gas this is an air water mixture so psychrometrics um, we have some uh, limited uh, brine information here um, propylene glycol and things like that and then these are um, fluids that are part of the NASA database um, if we stick with real fluids here you'll notice that what we have here on the left are the uh, properties that are available. So this is a list of all those different properties we can get. And then for each of the properties over here on the right, we have all the different fluids that are available. Right? Um, for each of these fluids, you know, each of the property correlations has come from the literature. And so one thing you might want to do is, is understand where did the correlation come from. And if you are interested in that, you should select fluid information. And for every one of the fluids, you'll see the source here. You know where did the where did the source of the information come from? And the other thing that's probably useful is the the range of applicability for the correlation. So that's important to know. The last thing we should talk about down here is the uh, example um, box, which is really useful. So let's say I want the enthalpy of acetone. Well, down here, if I if I don't want to type it in myself. Ease will construct the function call um, that I'm that I'm putting together up here, and then I can paste it in. So, if I want the enthalpy of acetone, I would select enthalpy acetone. I come here, and I would select the two intensive properties of interest that I'm going to use to fix the state, so temperature and pressure. And you can see it's it's built that function call down here, uh, assuming that uh, these are going to be array variables and state one. I could change this to state two. I can get rid of this completely and it'll make it scalar variables and I can paste then the result right here paste it down here right here and uh, you know that that's one way to construct function calls um, if you'd like to do it that way okay at this point I think um, you, you might want to take a break and go through problem one um, the problem and the solution are available on the website, and you can just make sure that you follow it along with what we've talked about uh, to this point. Uh, one other thing that we can do using ease that is related to properties is actually develop property plots. So, for example, temperature entropy, temperature volume, um, you know, HS type diagrams, all of these types of property plots that we have that we use all the time to understand processes and cycles, we can build those using ease. Um, and we don't need these property plots if we're using ease to actually get property data because of the, you know, the high accuracy property functions that are available in ease. But these plots are still very useful in terms of um, graphically representing a cycle or a trajectory of a process in a way that makes it easy to understand you know, where it's going. In, in, for example, temperature entropy space. So ease can generate these property plots automatically for any of the fluids that are programmed in it using the internal property correlations. And then in addition to that, we can overlay state onto these property plots to look at, to look at cycles in a very intuitive way. Um, 
So first of all, how do we generate a property plot? So let's go to ease here. If I want to make a property plot, I select uh, the plots menu and then go down here to property plot. And what you'll see here is uh, I have to select the fluid. So any of these fluids that are uh, programmed in ease I can use. I'll select acetone and then I have to select the type of plot. So, you know, all the familiar types here, TS, TV. Let's do a TS diagram for acetone. Down here I can select whether or not to include isobars, and if so, which ones, and here whether or not to include isocores, and which ones, and then finally whether to show lines of constant quality or not. If you hit OK, well there's a um, two-scale accurate temperature-specific entropy diagram for acetone. So that's how you make a property plot. Um, let's go ahead and do an example. This is a very simple example in which uh, carbon dioxide is expanded isenthalpically through a valve. So the upstream state is state 1, 45 degrees Celsius and 9 megapascal. The downstream state is state 2, and uh, that's 5 megapascal. So let's do this in ease. We'll go back here. The first thing I have to do is set the unit system. So I'll do that with the unit system directive. Um, I want SI units on a mass basis. Energy is joules. Temperature is Kelvin. And then pressure is Pascal. And we'll put the inputs in. The fluid I'm going to put in this string. Uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, the inlet pressure is P1. And that's 9 megapascal. Of course I'll convert that to pascals. So I'll convert from megapascals to pascals. The only temperature is 45 degrees Celsius which I need to convert to Kelvin. So I'll convert temp from Celsius to Kelvin 45 Celsius. And then the exit pressure is 5 megapascals. And I'll convert that as well. So those are the inputs uh, to solve the problem. Well, first I need to determine the uh, properties at the inlet state. So you'll notice here uh, at the inlet state I have pressure and temperature. So those are the two intensive properties that fix the inlet state, assuming I'm outside of the vapor dome. So here I have uh, the enthalpy is uh, obtained using the enthalpy function. The fluid is in the string F dollar and then it's fixed by state 1 uh, by the pressure so P equals P1 and the temperature T equals T1 and let's also get the specific entropy same um, same method for that just using the entropy function uh, if the valve is isenthalpic then that means the enthalpy at state 2 is equal to the enthalpy at state 1 so state 2 is specified by specific enthalpy and the pressure. So let's go ahead and get the uh, entropy and the temperature at state 2. So S2 is equal to the entropy of F dollar at H equals H2 and P equals P2. And then the temperature, I'll go with the temperature property function, the same calling protocol, H equals H2, P equals P2. So hopefully this works. Um, we can see that uh, all of our variables are now in an array table. So let's go look at the array table. And here it is. Um, none of the units have been set, which is why I'm getting these potential unit problems, but I can set these very easily. Um, set the units for the array variable H and P and S and then finally T. And the unit problems all go away. So one thing you'll notice that I did is I did this entire problem where um, I'm storing these properties in array variables rather than in scalar variables. And there's a couple reasons for that. One reason is just if I look at the arrays table, so Windows arrays table, my solution is very nicely organized now. It's organized such that uh, row 1 corresponds to state 1, and I can just read across and get all of the properties for row 1. And that's convenient. 
Um, the other thing that I can do is because it's, this information is in an array table, I can use it to um, to prepare a plot. Specifically, I can overlay on a property plot for carbon dioxide uh, these state points. So let's go ahead and do that. First, I'll create the property plot for carbon dioxide. So I go here under plots, property plot. I'll scroll down here to carbon dioxide. Uh, let's make a temperature specific entropy diagram. And uh, down here, I guess I don't want to show lines of constant quality or isocores, but I probably would like to show at least two isobars corresponding to 9 megapascals and also to 5 megapascals. And we'll get rid of these. And there's my, uh, there's my property plot. Um, I'm going to overlay on this property plot these state points that are in the arrays table. So I'll go up here to plots and select overlay plot. And uh, let's see. The source of the data is, of course, the arrays table. The x-axis is specific entropy. The y-axis is temperature. Over here, um, let's use blue and use big points for the states and then I can either join them with lines or in a lot of cases you won't want to do that. Um, up here I'm probably going to want to select this show array indices option and what that'll do is actually put the um, element number for the array right next to the point so you know the point that corresponds to state one will have a one right next to it and so on. And then I may or may not want to select automatic update. If I do select automatic update again, if I rerun this program with different pressures, for example, then the arrays table will change, and so will the plot. And so I can watch the state points uh, move around. So there's my result. I have uh, state 1 and state 2. You can see I start outside of the vapor dome, and I expand into the vapor dome. Um, because I selected automatic update, if I change this to, let's say, 3 megapascals and run the program again and look at my plot, well, you can see that state 2 moved. I can see that it's moved down here to an isobar corresponding to 3 megapascals. The, uh, the substances we've talked about so far are real gas substances. In other words, they um, are programmed, the correlations, the property correlations are programmed in such a way that they uh, can exist in subcooled, two-phase, and superheated um, states. There are also substances in ease that are programmed only uh, using the ideal gas law. So these are called ideal gas substances. These are you know, obviously much simpler equations of state. Computationally, they're much quicker, but they, uh, depending on where you're using them, are less accurate. Um, typically, the substances that are indicated by their chemical formula, uh, that, that's an indication that those are ideal gas substances. So for example, if you look in the list of, uh, of substances here in ease, so let's go to calculate options, function information, if you if you look through this list of uh, real fluids, you'll notice there's carbon dioxide. That's uh, the name spelled out, and therefore that indicates that it's a substance that can exhibit you know two phase states. If I click here on ideal gases, you'll see that there's also a substance called CO2. Well, CO2 is carbon dioxide, but it's modeled only as an ideal gas. And that's true for many of these things. There's hydrogen and H2, water and H2O, and so forth and so on. Uh, the one exception to that rule is air. Air is obviously a mixture, and the substance air uh, is uh, an ideal gas model of that mixture. <clears throat> There's also air underscore HA for high accuracy. That's you know a full model of air that can exhibit uh, subcooled two-phase and, and, and uh, superheated states. The property functions for ideal gas uh, work basically the same as they do for real fluids. Uh, the one uh, difference that you need to keep in mind is that um, enthalpy, uh, internal energy, and the specific heat capacity, Cp and Cv, for an ideal gas are only a function of temperature. And therefore, um, you cannot put in 
uh, temperature and pressure or temperature and specific volume or, or anything like that. It only wants temperature. So, you know, for example, if I want the, so let's set the unit system, uh, SI mass, joules, Kelvin, Pascal. If I want the enthalpy of uh, carbon dioxide using the substance carbon dioxide, which is the complete, you know, equation of state for carbon dioxide, I have to give uh, two properties. I could give T equals 300 Kelvin and P equals, I don't know, 300,000 Pascals. And that will give me uh, an answer in joules per kilogram. If I try to get the enthalpy of CO2, which is carbon dioxide models in ideal gas, using the same uh, calling protocol, the same two intensive properties to fix the state, I'm going to get an error. And the reason is because CO2 is models an ideal gas, and <coughs> it only needs pressure. It doesn't want and won't even accept pressure. So you can see too many independent variables have been selected. I have to only give it temperature. And uh, that's the answer for the ideal gas. And the reason these two values are so different is because the reference state for these two property correlations are, are different. And that's again the same for uh, internal energy, CP and uh, CV. Uh, if you want to see a list of all of the ideal gases that have been programmed in ease, you just go up here to the function information and click on ideal gases and here's here's that list. It's a relatively small list actually, however, um, there are just a, a large number of uh, ideal gases that are contained in the NASA ideal gas database. There's more than a thousand of those. Um, you know, this information about this database can be found here. And uh, you can see a list of those by clicking on NASA. And so you can see there's just a huge number here. Um, so that, that really expands the capabilities of ease with regards to particularly doing chemical equilibrium and chemical reaction type analyses. One thing, though, about these substances in the NASA database is that there's no transport properties over here. They don't have con uh, conductivity or viscosity or anything like that. Um, the ideal gas reference state is, is defined in a, in a way that is very convenient if you're trying to do um, chemical reaction problems, and that is that it's uh, based on um, zero enthalpy being the enthalpy of stable elements at uh, standard temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So therefore, when specific enthalpy is returned to you um, for an ideal gas, that enthalpy includes the enthalpy of formation for the actual substance. In other words, E's will give to you the standardized specific enthalpy that can be used directly in energy balances for chemical reactions. And that's very nice. Um, if I go back in here and hit done, and let's put ourselves on a molar basis, which is what's typically used for, um, for a chemical reaction, and solve this. This value right here, which is in joules per kilomole, that is the enthalpy of formation. Well, actually, if I set this to standard temperature, so 290, what would it be, 298.2, .2 and solve it, this is the enthalpy of formation for, for carbon dioxide that you would go look up in, in a table. Ease also includes uh, psychrometric properties. Um, Psychrometrics is the study of mixtures of air and water vapor at conditions that are near atmosphere pressure. It's, it's, it's a um, you know very important um, field of study if you're in the HVAC and R industry, for example. Um, if you want to access the psychrometric properties within ease, you need to use the fluid air H2O, which is uh, referring to an air water vapor mixture and uh, it's modeled as an ideal gas mixture with actually a few corrections that are um, implemented based on the ASHRAE handbook. Um, because it's a mixture, if you're using the fluid air H2O, you do have to fix the properties using three intensive properties rather than two. And the third intensive property is typically one that would indicate what's the concentration of water vapor. So either humidity ratio or relative humidity. 
Uh, the psychometric property functions are essentially the same as the normal property functions, except there's a few more um, that are specific to, to air-water mixtures, and those include the dew point temperature, the humidity ratio, the relative humidity, and the wet bulb. And then the indicators are also pretty much the same, except, again, there's a few more. I can fix the state using the wet bulb temperature, uh, the dew point temperature, the relative humidity, and the humidity ratio. One thing to keep in mind is, uh, as you know, if you've ever used a psychrometric chart, psychrometric properties are defined on a per mass of dry air basis. That's just the standard way of doing it, and it makes solving psychrometric properties just a lot easier. So let's do a real quick example. This is a steam coil. So over here I have some moist air entering the steam coil where it's being heated. It's one atmosphere throughout, 45 degrees Celsius with 100% relative humidity. And here's the volumetric flow rate, and then it's heated so it leaves at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. 45 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm sorry. Uh, we want to determine two things, I guess, here. What's the relative humidity of the, of the, of the mixture leaving? And then also, you know, how much heat transfer did I have to get from the steam coil? So, okay, let's go ahead and uh, enter the uh, inputs. So the first step is set the unit system. Um, I always tend to work in SI units on a mass basis, and we'll use Kelvin, Pascals, and uh, Joules. Uh, the inputs are the inlet temperature, so T1, and uh, we'll have to convert from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, and uh, the inlet temperature is 45 Fahrenheit. Uh, the inlet relative humidity is 100%. So phi 1 is equal to 1.0, and that's dimensionless. Um, the pressure throughout is 100,000 Pascal. And the volumetric flow rate at the inlet is 100, um, and that's feet cubed per minute, which we should convert from feet cubed per minute to meters cubed per second. So there's the solution. And if I go to the arrays table, I can change temperature to Kelvin, and this is in meters cubed per second. Okay, uh, the outlet temperature is also specified, and that's 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So T2 is equal to convert temp from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, 75 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, what's the what's the next step then? The next step is um, state 1 is completely specified. I know the pressure, the temperature, and the relative humidity, which tells me how much water vapor is in the air, so I can get any psychrometric property there at state 1. Um, we'll go ahead and get the humidity ratio, so we'll call that omega 1. And in order to get the humidity ratio, I have to use the property function humrat, which is humidity ratio, so H-U-M-R-A-T. The property uh, fluid is, is air H2O. And then, again, the three intensive properties that fix that state are the temperature, the pressure, and the uh, relative humidity. And if you look on this table, R is the indicator for relative humidity. So R equals phi 1. Uh, and then I'll get the density and the specific enthalpy as well. So rho 1 is equal to uh, density. And let's just copy this. And H1 is equal to enthalpy. And again, let's just copy this. Um, again, one thing that we have to be cognizant of is that these properties, enthalpy and density, are um, on a per unit mass of dry air basis. So this is joules per kilogram of dry air, not per kilogram of mixture. And this is kilograms of air per meter cubed. So let's solve this. And uh, go to the arrays window. This is in joules per kilogram. Humidity ratio is dimensionless, and density is in kilogram per meter cubed. Okay, um, the next step is uh, let's compute the mass flow rate of dry air, which is easily done. I know the volumetric flow rate um, here at the inlet, and I multiply it by the density, which again is in kilograms of air per meter cubed, and that'll give me kilograms of air per second. So let's do that. Um, m dot a is equal to rho 1 times v dot 1. 
and that's the mass flow rate in kilograms per second. Um, let's uh, fix state two. So because I'm not adding or removing water from the from the from the stream, the humidity ratio of state two has to be equal to the humidity ratio of state one. So omega two equals omega one. And then state two must be fixed by, well, the pressure is still one atmosphere. I know the temperature and I know the humidity ratio, so I can get anything else. Um, one thing I'm asked to get is the relative humidity. So let's get that. Phi two is equal to the relative humidity of air, air H2O uh, at, uh, what is it? It's uh, the humidity ratio, which is the indicator is W. So W equals omega two. Uh, P equals P and T equals T2. And I can also get the enthalpy. H2 equals enthalpy. And again, the state is fixed in the same way, so I can just copy that. And uh, there's my solution. Um, the humidity ratio of state 2, which is one of the things we're supposed to calculate, is 34.3%. And then finally, let's calculate the uh, energy from the steam coil. So this is Q dot is M dot times H2 minus H1. And you got to remember this works because M dot is kilograms of air per second and then these enthalpies are defined as joules per kilogram of air so you get joules per second. And if I hit solve, oh, I have to make that M dot air. If I hit solve, I find that it's uh, 984 watts. So that's how you do a psychrometric problem using ease. It really saves on, you know, looking through psych charts and so forth, and it's you know, it's very handy if you're doing any kind of air conditioning type problems. Um, if you select property plot for this fluid air H2O, what you'll get is a psych chart. And we can go ahead and do that. So if I go under property plots. And, you know, rather than acetone or air, if I select air H2O, I don't have any choices here. I'm going to get a psych chart. And I can include lines of wet bulb and specific volume and so forth. And that's what that looks like. And, again, just like any um, property plot, I can overlay my states onto this. So if I want to overlay my states, I do uh, what I do, overlay plot. Um, I want T to be the x-axis and omega to be the y-axis. Let's show the indices and make some big, bold blue lines. And there it is. There's state 1. And state 1 is being heated at constant humidity ratio, so there's state 2. Move that out of the way. Okay, at this point, uh, this, this seminar is done. And uh, if you want to test yourself, you can do problem number 2. Um, some other seminars you might be interested in are, are shown here. These are still relatively basic um, features of ease, curve fitting, functions, um, and procedures, convergence, and debugging, uh, optimization, numerical integration, uncertainty, propagation, and then how to use the, uh, the heat transfer library.